your life Whether you're ready or not Sometimes it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to not To take his hand Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Katie Schmidt. She is a, a painter, and not a starving artist, not a starving painter, but a professional painter and a devout Catholic. So we're excited to have her on the show. I don't think we've ever had a painter on the show. Oh, Doug. Okay. So this is a first, but good to see you, Doug. You too, Father. You're on a big Battle Ready tour, aren't you? Yes, we're in the midst of it right now. Um, this is uh, Indianapolis, uh, Lafayette, Indiana, I should say. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. flying in Indianapolis. And then uh, just got done with one in Wisconsin. Want to shout out to all those out there in Wisconsin, the Knights of Columbus, who really helped support this one out in Wisconsin. I got a follow up one in Green Bay Diocese as well. So be up there quite a bit, doing an awful lot, trying to promote uh, the Holy League, which is a new effort, uh, which um, uh, His Eminence uh, uh, Raymond Burke, Cardinal Burke, Raymond Burke. Right. Is, yes, he is the spiritual head of the Holy League. So I knew it. You didn't want to tell me before. I didn't want to tell you before, but it. you knew it was him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that announcement uh, has come out now that uh, Cardinal Burke is the spiritual head of the Holy League, which is an effort, a movement to try to establish a network of holy hours, monthly holy hours for men with confession and, and fraternity in parishes all over the world. That's mm -hmm. really the goal of it, to try to deepen that prayer, which is really what Battle Ready has always been about. Right. So it's a nice fit that I get to work with the Knights of Columbus up in Wisconsin and expand it from there, God willing, through much uh, much further across the country in the right. world. So, yeah, it's exciting all that's rolling. So, um. Well, tonight we're talking about uh, art and painting, and I went and looked up uh, John Paul II's letter to artists, I think it was back in the Jubilee year, and in it he quotes Vatican II's call to artists in the document on the church in the modern world, and it says, this world, the, the, church, the Council Father said, in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. Beauty, like truth, brings joy to the human heart and is that precious fruit which resists the erosion of time, which unites generations and enables them to be one in admiration. I like that aspect of art, how art can even unite us. Our contemplation of beauty, recognition of beauty, being drawn to beauty can unite us as a people in that human experience, but that how the world needs artists mm -hmm. to convey this beauty of the gospel, to, get, to convey the beauty of Jesus Christ, and to uh, use their talents in service of culture. Yeah, and it's, and it, you know, art is, uh, is overlooked and underestimated, I think, or underappreciated when it comes to that, about mm -hmm. the idea of beauty, uh, really, you know, pointing to something much more profound or sublime. You know, I think of uh, Michelangelo, who wanted people to have an encounter with God when they experienced his art, his sculpture, or his painting. You know, and, and that, that's, that's really the power of, of art is uh, it can move a heart and a soul to lift it to right. the Heavenly Father. That's incredible. Right, and it, it's not the only, of course, maybe not even the most important reason for art and beauty, of, but it has a great role in evangelization mm. and how it can, we hear that story all the time on the show, people hearing Gregorian chant or some piece of music or seeing some beautiful painting or church, how they can be moved and drawn into the faith by that, that you know, Bonaventure said, St. Bonaventure said that in things of beauty, he contemplated the one who was supremely beautiful, speaking about St. Francis, and led by the footprints he found in creatures, he followed the beloved everywhere. So beautiful things point to God who is beauty mm. itself and can be an important aspect of evangelization to bring people into the faith. I mean, if the faith isn't joyful, if it, if it isn't beautiful, we don't have a chance, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it fails completely. Right. I mean, it has to right. satisfy these deepest longings of happiness, of contemplation of beauty, experiencing the beauty, uh, the one that is beautiful. So uh, it has such an important role, doesn't right, it? Right, and simply put, we don't have a chance if we, if we, if we miss the beauty. Right. You, know, um, right. uh, you know, Father Thomas DeBay had written that book, The Evidential Power of Beauty, which speaks about 
you know, God being beauty itself. Yeah. And uh, that is something that everything we do in life, one way or the other, is supposed to indirectly or directly point to God. And art just has a very unique place in doing that. Right. One last quote. This is, this is a little bit dense, so just stay with me here. But <laughs> this is John Paul writing. He says, every genuine artistic intuition goes beyond what the senses perceive and reaching beneath reality's surface strives to interpret its hidden mystery. The intuition itself springs from the depths of the human soul where the desire to give meaning to one's own life is joined by the fleeting vision of beauty and of the mysterious unity of all things. You know, art is an interpretation. And you imagine like you have an artist that has the mind of Christ, so to speak. As Christians, we're called to put on the mind of Christ to, be, to guide our life by his values, to live according to those values. We're going to see reality in a different way, mm -hmm. in a deeper way than the non-believer. And the artist is highlighting that and bringing that to the surface in some way, capturing something of the essence of this. And, you know, religion supplies us endless themes of these deepest realities to man's life. And yeah. so. Which really speaks to the importance of the artist being close to God so that that interpretation that the artist can bring to the world is, is Christ-like mm -hmm. and is noble, honorable, sacred, and lifts the heart. Right. You know, so putting on the mind of Christ. Okay, so we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with Katie Schmidt, a great artist. We'll show you some of her work tonight and talk about uh, what motivates her. So don't go away. Back in a moment. to have our first painter, I believe, uh, Katie Schmidt. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. And <laughs> you have a deep connection with Birmingham. Your mom lives here now, and you spent fourth grade uh, through high school. Uh, through high school here, here so I got uh, about eight, nine years, so. And now you're living out in hip California <laughs> and supporting yourself as an artist. Yes. And I like oh. to get that message out there. It is possible, you know, young people are drawn to the arts, and it's, it's great to see someone that's you know, making a living from it. No, I've, I've been very fortunate and blessed to like um, meet, uh, uh, come in contact with fabulous teachers and mentors that have really given me a lot of excellent guidance and um, had a very supportive family and uh, friends too. And just uh, and, and being connected to like an arts culture out there also is, is really helpful, but yeah. And you went out to school in California and you stayed because you found an art community. Where did you go to school? I, I went to Laguna College mm -hmm. of Art and Design, um, which is like, it's a school based off of classical, classical um, methodology within painting, and but they had like illustration, animation, fine art, and graphic design there, but I, um, I chose to go into the, the uh, fine art route. Uh, one of my teachers, Betty Shelton, was saying to me, is that first I was wanting to do um, illustration, children's books illustration. She, I had her for some of my classes, and she was like, I think you're a fine artist. And mm. I was like, I think you're right, actually. Mm. My mother uh, um, had a folk art business when I was growing up, and I always would kind of see some of the drawings that she would do, and she did drawings for um, a pro-life movement. Uh, she made cards of Mother Mary, and um, mm. I, she taught me how to draw when I was young. and. Right. I, I kind of got into her paints and stuff too. So yeah. <laughs> had a hard time keeping me out of them, and right. but so. And you found uh, a faith community in Laguna Beach area, <coughs> Irvine, you said. Or, or right. Uh, in when I f first started out in school, I mean, it was it was really trying to. I, uh, you know, when you come into a new area and you're like really looking for yeah the faith community, and I, um, you know, was very blessed to have that um, through my school years, went uh, Catholic education and, and, you know, was able to go to Mass and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. loved going to Mass and, and praying with my class and things. But when I went out to California, it was a little bit more um, trying to find, but I, I was able to find Bible studies and, and, and met with uh, 
some of my roommates or other artists that we just definitely had like a spiritual bond and connection we were able to like you know encourage each other and support each other in, in a lot of ways at that time um, and met with a group called Focus that was it's actually not the Focus missionaries no. on uh, college campuses. It was a um, counterfeit group. Yeah, a counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> earlier when I mean, you were saying that they were with a PH, but it's actually <laughs> the, the, with the F, it was a Focus. Um, but, uh, and a lot of the members, one of the, the heads of the group left to go to St. John Cantius in Chicago mm. and became a priest. Um, mm. There, um, which actually St. John Cantus in Chicago is mentioning they're very um, much into taking old works of art and restoring them. If you walk into the church in Chicago, it's just gorgeous, like the, the pieces and the um, it's just old world feeling you know, when you walk into church. it. Uh, but and another, the, the Norbertines, the, the, um, they're more of a, they wear the white cassock like mm -hmm. the Dominicans have. They were a community that I've, uh, been connected to out there also right. have been very um, supportive and I, I've painted for some of their uh, St. Peter and Paul Parish in LA, um, yeah. uh, St. Terribio Romo um, portrait for, for them and some some other um, of their, uh, St. Michael the Archangel was also painted for, to raise money for their um, mm -hmm. gala that they were having. So you, you do secular art and religious art and this first segment we wanted to jump right into the art and show people because we have a lot of your images. I thought we'd talk about the St. Michael the Archangel one. That one struck me. And uh, can you talk about uh, your thinking behind, behind that piece? Sure. Um, well, the, the piece was originally, um, again, commissioned by some of the Norbertine fathers, of, uh, but they <coughs> let me just create what I wanted to create for mm -hmm. it. So I just knew that I was painting St. Michael the Archangel. Um, I read through some of the, the scripture verses about how Michael cast um, the devil into hell, and um, and I wanted to show. I had seen so many images of Saint Michael as you know being androgynous, but looking a little more feminine in some of the, <laughs> the paintings. Yeah. And so I was like, "Personally, this drives me nuts." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I some, know. Same here. Uh, really. Just put some stubble on the face. <laughs> That's gnarly. Manly in the hand. power, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so I, I definitely was trying to get away from that and really show some more of his strength that he had. And um, the, the devil, and you know, there were different models that I had for those pieces. The, the devil was a, um, he was actually a friend from school, and um, I had asked someone else An to old model. Black friend, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he. <laughs> He, he was a good friend and just, yeah. uh, you know, it was really kind of him to be willing to do that because I had asked somebody else and they said no. Um, somebody who um, I just was passing on the street, <laughs> really no, it was someone at a coffee shop, uh -huh. but <laughs> he was like, I just can't do it. And I was like, okay, you know, I mean, I normally I'll, I'll see people in a different place if I feel compelled to like ask somebody uh -huh. if they'd be willing to, um, but I guess, you know, that was right. a, that was a, what, what I liked one. about that, we saw, if you could maybe put the close-up of the devil again on there, that, and you pointed out, so I didn't fig figure out what was different about it that struck me, but he's, he's got that cold kind of paleness about him. He's still a very strong <coughs> figure. He's got big hands and a big body, mm -hmm. but why the, the bluish kind of cold? Yeah, it just, you know, St. Michael is a little bit more in, covered in light, but uh -huh. the, the devil yeah, he, no warmth. I mean, love is something that is very like warm and you know embracing. And I mean, devil and sin and turning away from God brings about this sort of it's an inner death and coldness. Um, I mean, and I I did want to express that and kind of what his figure was um, holding mm -hmm. as that sort of he was dying. He died to his relationship to to God and was being cast into the coldness of, of hell. And I'm sure that's only like a, uh, I can't imagine what, I've read certain descriptions of right. saints and mystics of what mm -hmm. they've seen and yeah. I barely was coming close to it, I bet, <laughs> you know, but. I, I love that idea. I never thought of Satan that way as being cold, like a corpse. Mm -hmm. I mean, strong, powerful, but no life in him. I thought that was a, a great fiction. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned to me one you wanted to talk about was uh, Sacramentum. Mm -hmm. That's an image of, uh, uh, do you describe it? 
Well, uh, this piece was done for my uh, MFA show at Laguna College um, of Art and Design, and it was, um, I was trying to get at, like, painting something that, I mean, <coughs> for me, painting um, aspects of the faith and using nature to convey that. Nature is something that we're constantly surrounded by. Everybody knows that we exist in, mm -hmm. in, in this world, but, um, you know, that we have these, even right now, it's like snowing outside, or was ha we were having some of that earlier. Um, but I wanted to place these, these sort of spiritual um, uh, beliefs and, and truths into this painting, um, but in a natural setting, mm -hmm. so that people could gradually come to it. There is a, um, I recently saw a movie about John Keats, the poet John Keats, um, mm -hmm. and he was saying within the movie, which I, I'm not sure if it was actually a quote from John Keats or just Jane mm -hmm. Campion's uh, writing on it, but mm -hmm. Um, he said the point of diving into a lake is not to not to be in the lake but to luxuriate in the sensation of water to mm -hmm. um, you know it's an experience beyond thought and you know it's it's mystery that soothes and emboldens this po poetry would is mystery that soothes and emboldens the soul to accept mystery mm -hmm. and I kind of think of that when I heard that as like that's what painting is for me and I hope that it would be that for other people too, mm -hmm. that it gradually like can talk to people in their own, it's the conversation between the painting and the viewer. And St. Thomas Aquinas said it's always 50% the viewer and 50% the paint or artist that's mm -hmm. talking. It has to be that kind of dialogue. And sometimes I f feel as if it falls on, on deaf ears, but I'm, I'm happy when people like kind of understand what it is and I'm, what I, what, what was happening in certain paintings. And this one was about the Holy Eucharist. And when she goes out into, these maidens are out in the woods, like I placed them in the snowy scene because being in the snow, there's something about, I mean, I grew up a bit in the Midwest and being around the snow that's sort of hushed and it's reverent. Mm -hmm. Everything's pure and white and mm. the animals are, you can barely hear them, you know. They put you in a contemplative like, stance. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that, I wanted to create that sort of space, but these women are um, veiled, they're preparing themselves, and they're showing that they're hungry to, for, and I wanted to show that they're hungry for spiritual food, and that um, in, a, you know, the, um, in scripture it says he sent down bread from heaven right. for them and, and it's that manna that he is giving us like and you know and sort of like I'm showing her trying to catch snow on her tongue but in reality to me it's that she, they're preparing for the Eucharist wow. but I mean God is always around us and everything and in, in every place but I wanted to show um, kind of bridge that with nature something that people encounter constantly right. Right. Um, so that and, and that painting has m multiple layers of meaning for me in that, you mm -hmm. know, constantly try to figure out how to paint some, uh, something of like, th about like the Eucharist, which is, it's the most amazing, uh, you know, thing to uh, try to, you know, understand and grow closer to mm -hmm. Christ and presence in the Eucharist. And well, there's that line in John 6 where he gives the teaching of the bread <laughs> of life and He's telling them about this bread of life he wants to give them, and he says, "Sir, give it." The people say, "Sir, give us this bread always." Yeah, they got, he's developing a hunger for it in them, and, uh, and of course, he gives us the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, let's talk about the sacrifice of the pelican. Okay. <clears throat> That's an interesting one. Tell us about that. Uh, have you ever seen the uh, pelican image? I'm sure you have. Yeah, up at the yeah. shrine. In fact, Mother Angelica has put it on the altar. Up oh, there. okay, mm -hmm. good, and and. You have also right. somebody, okay. Yeah, the, they're... Uh, I have pelicans at home. <laughs> <laughs> right. In Nebraska? Yeah. I raise them. <laughs> <laughs> a little side hobby. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I got to no, see that. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know what you mean. I have seen the images. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I recently, like, actually it was a Carmelite nun who um, told me about it. Uh, uh, one of the Carmelites out in Adorte um, at the Sant, uh, Santa Teresita home was telling me about the symbolism of the pelican. I was like, mm -hmm. I've never heard that before. This was, 
probably like two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I started to kind of investigate it more and I found um, the architect Gaudi mm -hmm. in Barcelona, I guess is how you would properly mm -hmm. say it. <laughs> he has on one of the portals, he has different portals in the cathedral, um, but one of them was of the pelican, it was in the, I believe the portal of charity mm -hmm. where the, the pelican was sacrificing itself and giving its own flesh to its young. And the legend would go that, and I, um, I'm not sure what, if it, you know, I just read about it and said that it was kind of a legend that developed but became known mm -hmm. to be like a symbol for Christ. And it would peck its breast and feed it to its young um, when there wasn't enough food. And just to, and that exemplified Christ's sacrificial love for us, giving himself totally for our so own the salvation. The and the pelican's tearing at its own flesh, her own flesh and giving it to the young. Mm -hmm. And but you have an interesting thing where you have adult pelicans flanking it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a s sort of a, uh, I was very inspired by Da Vinci's Last Supper and uh, Salvador Dali's, um, his Last Supper painting as well. I was looking at both of those kind of, um, I had this, the same number of pelicans as the apostles. Uh, and it, it, the way that it is arranged, I want it to be sort of an altar piece. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, the clouds are beaming down upon them and behind them is, you know, that's, that's hope and that's him, that's like the aspect of the divine and um, coming into the scene. But uh, over him there are vultures that are flying by, so it's still like that presence that, of evil that he's still fighting. Um, that, you know, I, that was some of the thought that was going in behind it, but they're all like, gestured and pointing sort of in a, um, a reverential way towards the main figure and the right. and wings spread out. So. And they are called <laughs> to imitate Christ in that way, right? In the Synoptic Gospels, you have the multiplication of the loaves. He turns to them and says, you give them something to eat. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't have any. We don't have any food. We don't have any money. And they multiply the loaves. But there's still that call upon his disciples. One day, this is an image of the Eucharist. You will give them something to eat. So they're called to have that same, I like that image. I've never mm -hmm. seen that done before, but it, mm -hmm. they're called to imitate Christ and like the pelican to give, you know, not only the Eucharist, but also of their very lives mm -hmm. to sustain and feed the flock, you know, with their love and how they lay down their lives. Wow, it's a, yeah, it, it's an incredible thing to yeah. think about. And after I, uh, I hung that painting for the final show and I went into a church in Santa Monica afterwards to just pray for a little bit. And I, I genuflected and I looked up and then there was the pelican on the altar oh, there really? too. <laughs> yeah. I, was at, I was like, okay, now I'm starting to see these, this more and more, but I, I felt like that was uh, now, God in, speaking a little In the bit. pelican picture, uh, uh, here we go. Um, mm -hmm. One of the top flying away, is that Judas leading? Uh, I kind of was thinking, of, I mean, yeah, that was that's, a little bit. <laughs> that's what I thought of right away is that, that's Judas getting out of there. Yes, you know? he, he left <laughs> mass early, he word. did. <laughs> You left, you left mass early. <laughs> okay, folks, there you no. go. That's what it looks like when we're leaving early. Flying Skedaddling. Away. <laughs> well, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with uh, Katie's own personal story and how she approaches her art. So uh, don't go away. Back in a moment. <laughs> Doug, do you have a question for Katie? Yeah. Um, do you have names for those pelicans in that painting? <laughs> Larry, Bob, and no, I don't know. <laughs> no, just Curly, Mo, and no. <laughs> um, what bothers you about the way art is treated in the world today? It's very commercialized in, yeah, very in many commercial. respects. And I understand graphic art with regards to we need a label for our soup can. 
that's different. Yeah. But we've also taken art to the degree of, of you know, let's just get out there and make money and be shocking with it and let's be mm. let's be so bold with it, but it's still devoid of any anything that, that has a reverence or a nobility to it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's who's given your life in such a way to, to um, perfecting a craft and art, mm -hmm. what what do you feel about the way art is treated these days? It's a good question. Uh, I would say that I mean I've I have many different feelings about it because I've I've seen a lot of um, I mean actually like I was uh, you know at one time I did really enjoy even like Thomas Kincaid like some of it, but he's been very like mass produced like with with the uh, prints and and things and but I mean he was able to make a, <coughs> a large amount of uh, money for his family and mm. I pr pr provide for them in that way I I, I think that. Everybody seems to d decide what they're okay with, and um, within like um, most artists that I know, will you know they they do the gallery shows, they they show um, in museums, uh, or, and they do commissions, and and they they teach also, and the there there are some like really uh, uh, amazing people out there who aren't like super commercialized, but I also know that. There have been many, I mean, when I walk down like Laguna Beach, there's a lot of like commercial art that's mm. down there. People selling paintings on, on the beach or um, doing like different celebrity paintings. And it's, um, there's just, there's different ways that people choose to yes. make art. I, I do feel like there are different forms of art that are a little more noble, like mm -hmm. you're saying that, and, and whoever, I mean, there's many many different kinds. I, I can't really like make a judgment on, uh, you know, whether or not uh, they should be. I think the work that bothers me the most is work that gets into um, defaming like the f the human person. Or like and that was gonna be my next question. When you yeah. see the 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 efforts out there that people refer to as art. Mm -hmm. But it, you know the Blessed Mother with you know being mistreated. I'm not even going to describe it. This was famous in the you know National Museum Art Museum mm -hmm. in, in New York or wherever that right. was. You know several years ago, and, and it's referred to as art. Right. And yet it, it it not only is is poorly done, but it's 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 blasphemous and it's it's sacrilegious and it's it's really horrible. Mm -hmm. How does that affect someone like you who has? you know, try to develop the prayer life relationship with God mm -hmm. in conjunction with the expression of your art. Yeah. Does well, it make you just want to throw things around It does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just Start like, throwing yeah. throwing easels across <laughs> and hitting someone over the head with an easel. Or a lamp and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it kind of, it kind of does. Sharpen my paintbrush and throw it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> or dartboard. Ninja throwing brush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's something that, I mean, I think if you see something that is, uh, disturbs you in a certain way, then it ultimately can motivate you mm. to go the opposite way, or sure. to, to stand for, you make your um, might for right, as mm. King Arthur would say, right? <laughs> um, to, to try to more so to do the right thing and to, you know. For me, I feel like the, the arts reflect the culture of the day. Mm -hmm. Artists reflect common thought and what we are we are all kind of experiencing, um, or what we might, f as a generation, need. I really feel like, I mean, I see that man aches for God, and Matthew Kelly would talk about that quiet desperation that man has. Mm -hmm. Like everybody is seeking after him, but not everybody can put their finger on it, and mm -hmm. that. I, and I've, there's been many who have said like history, historical pieces, and religious arts are the highest forms of art. I mean, their artists have painted from those for generations, and you, you look back, and I was telling you, Father Mark, about this earlier, that there was a, a Byzantine iconography show that I saw at the Getty Museum in LA that really inspired me, like to, um, there was a, an icon of St. Peter that was there. That right. I, I all right, yeah, we have that one, number two, I think it is, St. Peter icon. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, it was, it's an encaustic painting that was done um, of, of St. Peter from, you know, very soon after St. Peter had died. And mm -hmm. I, I looked at it, you know, there at the Getty in the middle of L.A. and just was like in uh, amazement that this was a work of art 
that's been around for a few thousand years. Like, mm -hmm. and it still looks like in pretty good shape, and it's made out of wood and you know pigment and wax and caustic painting. This is Th the this, piece. this piece. Oh no, this is what she painted. This is yeah. your well, piece. Well, no, that wasn't my. P that was the actual piece oh, that I the saw. Oh, that's actual. Oh, yeah. Um, and <coughs> there, like that, there's real power in that. All those other paintings that are done of just like common culture or just like eye candy type things, right. you know, like those are going to fade. Yeah, they're going to fade. Yeah, pop not music gonna passes, <laughs> Mozart and Beethoven are still around and right. still will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe talk. Yeah. Right. You mentioned to me earlier too about, you know, the objectification of women we see in the arts, that you see <coughs> some of your work as trying to counteract that. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a motivation for me to m make work that is more um, focused on the spiritual and and I, I try to you know and with that comes like that reverence for mm -hmm. who we are mm -hmm. as human beings and um, the dignity of each person mm -hmm. and conveying th that dignity within how you paint like and having that sort of love within it uh, but I, I've definitely I've seen a lot of um, artwork that almost comes across as pornographic or is definitely like um, defaming like women and and lowering uh, you know and mm -hmm. it's um it's very you know uh, heart wrenching and heart uh, stirring to do the opposite again of that um and mm -hmm. i think uh, sometimes like common thing can artists will try to paint like the pain that they feel mm -hmm. um of the human condition and um within painting the spiritual it's kind of also showing like embodying that but also like where we're going who are we and where mm. we come from and where are we going kind mm. of and taking it into like um keeping your eyes focused where mm. and, and helping us because we all need to have those religious images to that's why we have them in churches and and we have paintings behind the altar and statues and they're there to kind of help place our minds in, in front of God and, right. and we need help to our prayer life, yeah. you know. We need to mention, you have a, a big commission in Peoria, uh, or talk about that, the Stations of the Cross. And oh, they're, at, they're in uh, Purdue. Oh, Purdue, sorry, um, yeah. Indiana. Uh -huh. um, they're, they were commissioned by um, St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center uh, for the Purdue students. And um, they're actually accessible, I was gonna say, on if you have an Android phone, mm -hmm. you can uh, pray with them, uh, and do the Stations of the Cross and according to the way of St. Francis. So they have prayers mm -hmm. that will come up and- That's uh, under an app? Uh, an app on an Android phone, mm -hmm. which I, I don't have one of those, so I couldn't tell you how to uh. work it, but I know <laughs> that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe do like yeah. a search in the apps under Katie Schmidt, it might pop up. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, but they're, for the stations, they're, um, when I was painting these, I, I was wanting them to, again, to be a, a sort of meditative, um, sacred conversation between whoever was looking at them, to be a, a prayerful place that they could come, um, and almost, again, be sort of like a candle in the darkness, bec the, that sort of uh, tenebrism that was surrounding them that that dark and shrouding the light of the of the painting and that Christ showing Christ in that darkness but he overcame it and came through that way of his passion um, that was sort of uh, some of the thought that was going into those works yeah the, the one I liked uh, is what shows Jesus embracing the cross and I thought you really captured that he wasn't just taking the cross or holding it there was almost like this gentle embrace. Talk about yeah. that. I, uh, I had, again, like seen a few different station versions. Mm -hmm. that I, <coughs> for this one, like it just came about that I, I wanted him to, I, I told the, the model, you know, to really embrace you know, the cross and mm -hmm. show, and, and the way that it all happened was that it just came out with like a great love of um, holding on to this uh, wooden cross beams that would be a sort of a vehicle for him and, and the cross a vehicle mm -hmm. for our own salvation. I mean, right. But he lovingly like took it upon himself and mm -hmm. fully like embraced it. And I think that it, um, it, it worked out to kind of convey some of those feelings. Yeah, I like 
Yeah, you said it, it's almost like a light, these images in the stations. You know, Jesus is the light of the world. So I would imagine like you're prayerfully looking at this and you are really honed in, focused on the essence of that, of Jesus takes up his cross, you know, he's embracing it. And it is a powerful meditation. You think about those themes. Yeah. yeah. I, I heard it said that that's one of the greatest things to meditate on, or St. Saint Francis, Saint Francis actually started the Stations of the mm -hmm. Cross, didn't he? Popularized I mean, devotion to the crucified right. image. Which is very good to know for this time of year, especially. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the role of prayer in, in your art. Uh, with with prayer, um, I feel as we pray, I mean, we are trying to make ourselves open to like the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and connecting ourselves. Being, I, th I think, Father at Mass to say, today was saying that we are being more rooted in God. We are becoming that that tree beside the mm -hmm. stream. That you know, right. and yeah. um, I. Th for me, when I am painting, I feel like I'm praying because it's very contemplative, and mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, able to, and especially when painting, you know, sacred works of art, like the subject matter, trying to bring uh, these images to life, to to be something to for people to contemplate and mm -hmm. help others to pray, is a um, something that I I really take a lot of. Uh, joy and and I'm very thankful to be able to do that but um, it, it really it, it does feel like I feel more connected to God when I'm praying and I think actually in Chariots of Fire the runner said uh, when he was running when I run I feel God's pleasure you know he um, would like look up when he yeah. <laughs> Charles Little or something that he would or yeah. Eric Little Eric Little uh, yeah mm -hmm. well maybe is, in this next question we can roll the Franciscan pictures behind, but talk about the role of of arts in the church at this time. Uh, well, it, there's been a lot that the church has gone through. I mean, with the iconoclasm and uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's periods of um, less uh, artwork in some churches or minimalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I, f I feel that um, you know. People are very visual. Uh, we're very visual learners, mostly. Right. So, uh, to have like works of art in, in churches that help us to pray is, is for our greatest benefit and um, and opening ourselves up to yeah. the uh, you know to to mystery and to beauty and to learning um, how. And he sometimes he does like people have cried in front of different uh, works of art because of being so moved. It, it's a sort of it pulls something yeah. in you in a way uh, to uh, uh, an understanding that is kind of um, it, beyond It lifts thought. us to another world. Mm -hmm. It points us to God, right? If our, right. our churches don't have that beauty, I know Mother Angelica spoke so much about that and what she wanted to do with the shrine is to make it a place of beauty, a place of contemplation that just transports us to another world and uh, yeah. of adoration. Well, that's what's been one of the key aspects of the Pieta was just this taking you to a different place that an unimaginable grief-stricken mother of God holding her son, you mm -hmm. know, Michelangelo's Pieta is, is, is incredible. You know, the one of the Franciscan that we just saw a moment ago, um, I mean, there, there was a, a certain, even the gesture in the hands that, that you've got crisscrossed. Not mm -hmm. only does, does it resemble Father Mark, you know, in the expression yes. of holiness that you see <laughs> in his eyes. Good. There it is. Yeah. See, now that does resemble Father Mark it very does. much so. Uh, yeah, I'm and not just the brown robe. <laughs> I know. I'm but there's wow. a beautiful expression. But the hands. But there is something even in the way you've got the hands extended that just almost mm. speak of a of a letting go and a, a, a yet a, a grasping or holding on to something interiorly. Yeah, I, when when I was uh, working on that, actually, I saw like the the images of him like with his hands like this and mm. it was uh, I read that it was like a position of humility like great humility mm. like oh my my god you know like I you feel he, like unworthy to mm. I, I mean just if you do that I mean or when you hear something that just like strikes you with awe you're kind of like mm. or that right. it's kind of a position that you would take and even mm. even the brown that you wear is a 
Like, supposed to be like earth. The earth. Humility. Yeah, like humility. Humus, yeah. humus means. Why are you dirt. laughing, Doug? Because no. <laughs> I know you're wearing a, 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 a military green battle ready shirt underneath, probably. You know? Well, <laughs> I do wear your battle sh cargo ready pants. shirts underneath. But, uh, <laughs> In cargo pants, yeah. <laughs> well, we got to take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, more of uh, Katie's own journey and her own journey of faith. So don't go away. Back in a moment. <laughs> devotional life. I know you're connected with the Norbertines out there. Mm -hmm. and Talk about that, how you practice your faith. What sustains you spiritually? Uh, well, I've, I love going to Mass. I love praying the Rosary and, and uh, just from, there's been periods where I've, I've really just been able to go to Mass like daily and it's, it's I just absolutely am in love with uh, their Catholic faith and um, but I've always been growing in it uh, you know as I have uh, grown and suppose I could, um, well, uh, the Norbertines have, uh, have, have a spiritual director out there also who's um, Father Alphonsus mm -hmm. and uh, been very blessed to be able to just always have like good counsel and, and, um, and different things and so I, I'm very thankful to have uh, such a, a strong uh, community out there of uh, Catholics uh, that have grown over the past few years. The Orange County Catholic community is really, um, there's a huge amount of Catholics that are out there and I think that it's really, in the past few years the diocese has really grown um, with um, Bishop Kevin, um, is, uh, Van has really uh, been bringing a lot of people together and I also know there's a, a new EWTN tower that's right. starting out there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be neat to have you all there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, you talk about the friends you have out there and some of the Bible studies you've done, like participate in and even led some women Bible studies. Uh, there was the, the focus group that we, we would pray together. We'd read about um, different saints. Um, and I've, we'd also had, um, I, I would lead a Bible study with my friends and mm -hmm. we would go over different s saint writings and we pray the rosary together also. And um, currently I'm like uh, organizing a, a Bible study for, for us to keep growing in um, those ways. And uh, something, a, a quote that I was thinking of earlier, as you may notice, I love quotes, so I keep uh -huh. saying that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Chagall said something about, you know, I will, um, in, re in regards to the Bible, there is a great uh, inspiration that we have in it. And it's a, wide palette to dip our brush into is the Bible yeah. um, right. and c constantly you'll find things that artists are continually um, getting into to uh, you know put into their work I think in in regards to you asked a yeah so that was yeah I, did, I thought it'd be important just to say that you know, you've had some challenges out there at, at the school you're at and certainly in the artistic world mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things antithetical to the gospel but you know, these are ways you found that you could uh, you know, live your faith and, and survive and live it vibrantly. And I, this show won't be complete unless we show you <laughs> painting there. It looks like you're on Laguna Beach or something and you're with your, your palette yes. and your colors. If we could pop that up. I just love this picture of you. Uh, <laughs> see, that's my yes. concept of south of France painting <laughs> a seaside image or something. Yes, yeah, so. southern France. Hey, uh well, I had my pellets. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? No. <laughs> Shouldn't yeah, she have so a beret on if she was French? <laughs> <laughs> I actually have one. I should have oh, brought that one. <laughs> <laughs> so how how can people get a hold of your art? If they want um, to? You can go to katieschmid.com. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I have a few different um, you know sites that are at the end of the page, but uh, katieschmid.com would be where you can access my work, mm -hmm. and also my email is at the end of my website. It's kschmid fine art. Okay. Um, and uh, yes, I would love to hear from people. And, right. and um, also, the, uh, I really recommend the Android app, uh, and right. for, for uh, especially during this Lenten season, to help people through uh, the Stations of the Cross. 
uh, I am, am trying to work out a show at the cathedral right now during the um, month of June for the Feast of the Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. or the month of the Sacred Heart, um, down in uh, their um, gallery space. So, so okay. hopefully I'll stay tuned wi for those announcements. And All right. But, yeah. As you've gone through your career, what like, artist or key pieces have really jumped out at you and been, you know, very impactful to you? Um, there are a great many, actually. Um, I've, I've really, I mean, my mother used to give me books when I was growing up, and I was telling Father Mark about this. I mean, the, from Lives to the Saints, again, those were, but also, like, she, Raphael, Michelangelo, his drawings, and mm -hmm. I would do, like, master copies of, of him and Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it's kind of hard, well, to, kinda yeah. hard to beat those guys. I know, know. they're hard to top. <laughs> they just, they've been around so like long, and they just, it was just so excellent, so much what they did. And like you said, yeah. even their sketches, the sketches of, of da Vinci, you know, the peel back of the human body, the flesh, the bones, the, all this. And it's incredible. Just even the way he artistically showed the peeling back of the skin and the body was phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, their study though is like they wanted to know how everything worked because mm. you can't draw something unless you know how it how it actually works like the natural and I'd form heard, of it. I'd heard that that, it, that more than than understanding the, the the outside of the body it's so important to understand the structure inside the bones and the muscles the skeletal structure in order to understand how the outside should be drawn to be to be more authentic. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is it's very true very true I agree. Let's talk about Saint Therese. That was mm. a she is a powerful figure in your spiritual journey. Yes, um, actually, I, I was going to say uh, that that was a very influential turn into like bringing me into the arts. When well, it br just in my inner life and what came out in my art. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I was telling you about how um, I I didn't know who she was, Saint Therese of Lisieux, uh, at that time. My mother used to watch EWTN, and it was on TV mm -hmm. uh, here in Birmingham, because we had just moved here. And I um, saw something about her and how she said that she would send down a shower of roses and I, uh, you know, to those who asked for her intercession. This, this painting is actually about her, and um, th it's supposed to be her that's in the sky, and and I wanted people to kind of place themselves as the being the figure receiving those mm. roses. Uh, That's kind of what it looked like for me mm -hmm. when after I prayed the novena. I saw just like that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't dressed like yeah. that. Well, you, you, you got in, it. You I was got in her cam special. I was in camouflage pants. <laughs> and, and <I'm> just <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. But that I want to see that. That is beautiful. That yeah. Coming down from heaven, flower, the roses coming from heaven. Yeah, it, th this was actually kind of a little bit of what happened was, in, well, in my dream, I was, I woke up, I, I, a few months later, I didn't, I don't remember what I asked her for. A few months later, I woke up, I went to theology class at school at Our Lady of the Valley, mm -hmm. and I, um, in the dream, I, I remembered the dream in the class, I remembered that in the dream, I woke up to the strong smell of roses, but I was still in the dream, but that's what woke mm -hmm. me up in the dream, was the smell of the roses. Mm -hmm. There are cut red roses all around, and um, wet, uh, like it had just rained rock going up and ominous clouds in the sky, but with mm -hmm. some sun shining through. And there was St. Therese and she smiled and then my dream ended. Mm -hmm. And I was just very struck by it and um, remember it vividly to this day. And I, was, I drew it right after it happened. Although it might have been lost in some of my, <laughs> all my siblings drawings mm -hmm. at uh, 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 the time, um, but I just decided that I wanted to do a painting kind of like representing something of what that um, dream meant to me and I chose her as my confirmation saint and I felt like personally that she was just saying with that dream that she was going to walk with me or be, she was going right. to help me and, right. and it was a, a dream that I had received right before a difficult period in life. Um, yeah. so. So really it was a consolation, gave you hope and mm -hmm. turned you to God in a powerful Definitely. way. Yeah. Most people get a rose when, you know, an answer to the, you know, prayers to St. Therese. Mm -hmm. As an artist, you get an inspiration to paint pictures of roses. 
That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> I was like, thanks, girl. No. <laughs> and we have to give credit to Mama, right? That yes. she prayed your way through art school. And, right. And My mom was always praying. She yeah. was very, yeah. And we, we all need our moms to yeah. always be praying for us, right? And so yeah. I'm very thankful to have uh, yeah. my mom handed down her faith, you know, to all of us. Like, right. you know. And if people want to buy a, a copy of your prints, or do you sell prints and things of your work? I do. I sell prints, and uh, they're, they can purchase. I'm setting it up on my website right now so that they can purchase them on my website. Um, I sell them. Um, uh, in the, at the Shrine National Shrine of St. Francis in San Francisco, um, also down in um, Southern California, and I was going mm. to talk to you all about possibly selling them here if you'd like. Yeah. I mean, but religious catalog, yeah. yeah. So we'll look into that. Yeah, so they're definitely accessible. All right. Well, thank uh, you so much for joining you. us. Thank you. It's a, a real uh, joy to be here with yeah. you both. I'm sorry, my hands are cold. <laughs> you're a light and a warrior out there in the in the world of art, and uh, so keep up the good work and. The church oh, needs art, you. the gospel needs art, and uh, it's a powerful way to communicate the, the message of faith. So. Uh, I, yeah, it's, a, it's a joy to do. So. Great. Yeah. Well, may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We'll see you mm -hmm. next week. <laughs>